Do you remember when you learned that your father murdered Jeffrey Dahmer? Yeah, it's a big picture that popped up, and I was just shocked. Ten, I saw it on TV, and that's how I found out. Jeffrey Dahmer's story has been told a million times before, most recently in Ryan Murphy's new true crime series, Dahmer, Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story for Netflix. The series focuses on not just Dahmer and his crimes, but more prominently the many attempts neighbors and witnesses made to stop him in his tracks while Milwaukee police turned a blind eye. While Wisconsin State had abolished the penalty by the time of his trial, Dahmer's 15-time life sentence in prison seemed to mark an inevitability that he would be slayed there, lest he spent the rest of his life in solitary confinement. It only took two years and two attempts for someone to take his life, with Christopher Scarver delivering the blow that ended the life of the man known as the Milwaukee Cannibal. By the time he was arrested in 1991, Dahmer had taken at least 17 lives, most of whom were young gay men of color. He had decapitated some, eaten body parts of others, and in some cases had tortured them before they met their maker. For many, the passing of Dahmer was seen as a blessing, blurring even the most stringent moral code. After all, when you hear he drilled a hole into a 14-year-old skull before filling his brain with acid, it's hard not to. But what happened to his slayer, Christopher Scarver, and why did he do it? This is the story behind the serial slayer's slayer and where he is now. Who is Christopher Scarver? Christopher J. Scarver Sr., born 1969 in Milwaukee, was originally in prison for the 1990 slaying of Steve Lohman, a training program worker. A high school dropout, Scarver had trained at the Wisconsin Conservation Corps work program as a carpenter. He believed after the program was complete, he would be employed full-time, following a promise by supervisor Edward Patz. However, when the job never materialized, Patz was fired before it could be, an angry Scarver had returned to the center in order to confront him about it. By that point, Scarver had been using marijuana for a number of years and had been drinking heavily. He'd also started getting motivated by a voice inside his head, declaring him the chosen one. On June 1, 1990, Scarver returned to the core center to confront them and found 27-year-old Steve Lohman, Pat's replacement, and site manager John Fayen. Holding Lohman at gunpoint first, he demanded money, and when he only received $15, shot Lohman straight in the head. Despite Lohman being lifeless, Scarver would then shoot him two more times. In order to spare his life, Fayen gave Lohman a $3,000 and its credit card to get him to go away. Scarver was quickly caught, found with the money, gun, and credit card from the attack, and arrested. He was convicted for the slaying of Lohman, being given a life sentence, later saying he knew he'd done wrong and wasn't sure why he'd snapped the way he did. In 1992, he was sent to Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, Wisconsin. At the time of the slaying, he had recently discovered he was expecting to become a father for the first time and had been kicked out of his familial home by his mother. Why slay Jeffrey Dahmer? Christopher Scarver made international news when on November 28, 1994, he battered Jeffrey Dahmer to his end at the Wisconsin prison. Scarver, who was 25 years old at the time, had been assigned a work detail with two other inmates were left unattended by guards while they cleaned a restroom at the prison gymnasium. Uh, when I was young, I didn't know what it meant, obviously, but, you know, that name, you know, has been around me for... That you heard the name Jeffrey Dahmer? Uh, heard it a lot growing up. That's all I heard. Um, he ended up dead. I put his head down, Scarver explained in the interview. As most of Dahmer's victims were people of color, largely black or Hispanic, and Anderson initially led police on a goose chase for two black men he said had committed his crime. Some believe this was an added incentive for Scarver. However, officially the slayings were not considered as racially motivated crimes by detectives. I needed some guidance and I just told him everything that I was going through and he's starting to go down the wrong road and I started to, well that's when I that's why I wrote him, you know, I didn't know what to do, how I felt about me and his relationship, all those built up years, all that pain that I had, I finally just let it go. He crossed the line with some people, prisoners, prison staff, some people who are in prison are repentant, but Dahmer was not one of them, he told the paper. He claims among Dahmer's pranks, he would use ketchup packets to mimic blood and would shape prison food into the shape of body parts to play up his Milwaukee cannibal persona. This was later seemingly backed up by Madison pastor Roy Ratcliffe, who said he'd been told by prison guards Dahmer would joke, I bite, and had a Cannibals Anonymous meeting poster in his cell. However, this claim was rebuked by Gerald Boyle, who had defended Dahmer at his trial, saying taunting wasn't the serial slayer's style. 
Dahmer was such a milk toast. He would have never done that stuff, Boyle told media. He slayed people, but he didn't taunt people. I never saw him do anything that would lead me to believe that he would mimic the passings that he caused. I just don't believe that. Scarver had never had direct interaction with Dahmer ahead of slaying him, instead opting to keep a distance from the serial criminal who, after moving to general population, had to have a prison guard with him at all times because he was a prime target for other inmates. In the last few months of his life, Dahmer had also become a born-again Christian after studying the Bible, with his baptism occurring just months before his passing. After being arrested for the double slaying, Scarver initially pleaded insanity due to his past history with mental health issues. Shortly after the slaying of his first victim, Loman, Scarver declared that he was the chosen one and had a number of voices telling him what to do. It's a lot of pressure on a kid when a parent is incarcerated. However, in the case of his arrest for Dahmer and Anderson slayings, Scarver was declared competent to stand trial. He later changed his plea to no contest in exchange for a transfer to a federal penitentiary. Where is Christopher Scarver now? At the time of this video, as per his convictions, Scarver remains in prison at Centennial Correctional Facility, Colorado. He has since been diagnosed with schizophrenia with behaviors that have been considered a danger to himself and to others. He continues to be highly religious and has turned to poetry as a hobby, even releasing his own books, God Seed and The Child Left Behind. In 2005, Scarver filed a civil rights lawsuit against Wisconsin Secure Program Facility, aka the Supermax Prison, for violating his constitutional right not to be subjected to cruel and unusual punishment. This included, he claims, more than a decade in solitary confinement, with the cells being noted on some officials' levels of restrictment at the jail being windowless and reaching 100 degrees during the summer. Those on antipsychotics are prone to heat stroke, making his suffering worse. The case states that he asked to be moved after three years, with a district court determining conditions at Supermax are so severe and restrictive that they exacerbate the symptoms that mentally ill inmates exhibit. In juvenile detention, have a parent incarcerated. And we're really trying to slow this down. However, it was argued his movement into Supermax was not a deliberate attempt to cause him undue distress and exacerbate his mental illness. Things like constant illumination of his room was argued to be for his own safety due to self-hurt attempts, and removal of items from his room was done so to prevent injury. So despite backup of other inmates and a further appeal, the complaint was not held up and thrown out in 2006. In 2012, he attempted to shop a tell-all memoir about slaying Dahmer, paid in part by the Creative Corrections Education Foundation, set up to help students whose parents are in prison. He has reconnected with his father, and the pair continue to write to each other today. That's all for this video, folks. See you another time.